Well, good morning and welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us today. For those of you who are joining us online today, thank you for being a part of our community as well. And let me just kind of reiterate what Jonathan said a moment ago. We need you here on next Sunday night. Change your plans if you need to, but we need you here. It is going to be a a very important moment in the history of our church. And for those of you that are joining us online, I would encourage you to buy a ticket as well and and come out and be a part of the service on that night. It is just going to be absolutely fantastic, and I'm very excited about what God's going to do for our church and what God is going to do through each of us as well. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about doing our part requires commitment, commitment. Now, commitment is a beautiful thing. I know sometimes some people don't believe that commitment is a big thing or an important thing because they're like, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to commit to that uh, because I don't like to commit. But I am very glad that there are people in our lives that commit. Aren't you glad that your doctor committed to studying and learning in medical school when he has to treat you? Aren't you glad that your spouse committed to you through the good and the bad, the thick and the thin? Uh, Kim and I next Sunday is our 35th wedding anniversary, and so we are going to be celebrating. Uh, Thank you. We're going to be celebrating in church, all right? So uh, we are very thankful for commitment. Thank God for commitment. Commitment is critical, and it is required to accomplish most things. I mean, the fact is, when you buy a house or sign a lease on an apartment, you make a commitment. When you buy a car, you make a commitment. When you say, I'm going to exercise, you make a lie to yourself, right? All right, so a commitment. No, a commitment. We make commitments to do these things. When you say, I'm going to eat better, uh, what you mean is you're going to eat Chick-fil-A and chocolate cake and all of that, right? No, we make a commitment to be healthy. We make a commitment, and commitments are crucial. They're very, very important. On the other hand, Making a half-hearted commitment is dangerous. Making a partial commitment, not a full commitment, but just a halfway, a partial commitment, and and that can lead to some very difficult things, some very bad things. Just watch a squirrel try to make a commitment to cross the road. You ever watched that before? That's kind of funny to me. They're like, boop, 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 going back and forth, back and forth, and uh, half the time they get run over. And that's their fault because they didn't make a commitment, right? Well, that doesn't turn out well for a squirrel. Um, But when you make a half-hearted commitment, it can be painful. When I was young, I used to love to swim. Now, I'm not much of a swimmer now. Uh, In fact, we've lived in the neighborhood where we live for 17 years. And some of you have this in your neighborhood. They have one of those uh, swimming pools up front, right? You know, where the community can use. And in 17 years... I have been in that swimming pool exactly zero times. Now, I don't plan on getting in that pool. If I live there another 17 years, don't plan on getting in that pool. You say, why not? Because kids get in that pool. And I know what they do when they get in that pool, all right? And uh, I'm not going to let that water get on my mouth or on my face is all I'm saying. But when I was young, I used to love to go swimming. And uh, one summer, I wanted to learn how to dive. And I had an adult that was teaching me, and they said, one thing you got to do is you got to, you got to commit to the spring. In other words, you got to spring and straighten out. You got to spring and straighten out. You got to spring and straighten out. Well, I got the spring part down, but I just never could quite commit to that, that straightening out part. And as a result, what happened to me every time that I would try to make a dive Instead of making a beautiful dive where I entered the water without much of a splash, I just did a giant belly flop. That's basically all I did because my problem was that I didn't fully commit. And I believe that there are many Christians that they don't make a full commitment. They make a partial commitment. They make a halfway commitment. And as a result, they flop in their Christian life. And I really do believe this. I believe that there are many Christians that make enough of a commitment to make themselves miserable. I want you to think about that. There are a lot of Christians that they are just committed enough to be miserable. 
They're not fully committed. They don't enjoy the Christian life. They don't understand the grace of God. And what they do is they make just enough of a commitment to make them miserable. Well, I got to go to church again this week, I guess, you know. Well, they're calling for people to give, and uh, I guess I'll do that. I don't really want to. Uh, they're calling for people to, you know, serve around there, and I'm, I'm just not really that interested in it, but I guess I'll do it. Well, if you make a partial commitment, a halfway commitment, you're probably going to be miserable in your Christian life. And so today, we want to talk about making the kind of commitment that God is pleased with in your life. And we're going to read a couple of passages of Scripture. In fact, we're going to read from 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, and then from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God's looking for you to make a commitment. He's looking to bless people that make a commitment. Those people that make a commitment, God says, I'm going to strengthen them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to be with them. And then Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, one of the most famous passages that the apostle Paul penned, and here's what he said. He said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Everybody say that, living sacrifice. Say it with me, living sacrifice. You notice that that's kind of what they call an oxymoron, living sacrifice. You know what a sacrifice is? It's dead. It's, it's given up its life. And God says he wants us to be a living sacrifice. Why is that? Because like the apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, though I am Uh, dead in Christ, yet I live because of Jesus Christ. I'm dead to the flesh. I'm dead to the old ways. I'm dead to my old nature, but I am alive in Christ. What God wants from me is a living sacrifice. In other words, I am buried with Christ in his death, and I'm resurrected to walk with him in resurrection victory. That's what God wants for my life. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We're going to come back to that little phrase there. Um, It can be translated reasonable service. It's reasonable to serve God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be transformed by the renewal of of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God wants you to know his will. God wants you to be able to find direction in life. God wants you to be able to know what he wants for you to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to know the will of God for my life. I want to have direction in my life. And God says that there's a way to do that by making a commitment to him. Making a commitment to him. I want to give you just a couple of thoughts today about what making a commitment does, what God is looking for in making a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. Here's the first thing. God looks for committed people. Let's read that passage from Uh, that verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, again, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. In other words, he's looking. God's looking throughout the earth. He's just watching. He's watching our lives. He's looking for people that will commit. He's looking for those that will say yes. He's looking for those that will get on board. He's looking for those that will live for him. God's looking for people like that. Don't think for a minute that it's not important what you do. Don't think for a minute it's not important what you decide. I I talk with people all the time. And they don't think it's that important that they come to church. And yet you have family members, you have children, you have a spouse that's watching you. Oh, there are many people that don't believe that their decision is that important if they decide to serve or not. But your service will make a difference. 
God is looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's what he's looking for. Now, that does not mean that God is looking for perfect people because there are no perfect people. We say all the time at Avalon Church, Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. I want you to look at the person sitting next to you. Go ahead and do it. Look at it. Look at them. Don't look at me. Look at the person sitting next to you and say, you ain't perfect. Now, I hope you didn't get mad because you're not perfect, but you can look right here on this stage and say, he ain't perfect either, all right? Why? Because only Jesus is perfect, and through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, he saves us and justifies us and puts us in right standing with God. So when God looks at us, it is as if we are perfect because of the blood of Jesus and because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God is looking for committed people. Let me ask you this question. Are you committed? Are you committed? Now, we all commit to something. I mean, at the very least, you're going to commit to do binge watching on Netflix, right? I mean, we commit to something. We commit to a lifestyle. We commit to a job. We commit to our family. We commit to a home. We commit to a car. God is looking for people to be fully committed to him. Now, once again, being fully committed to God does not mean you're perfect, but it does mean that you are giving God first place in your life. Let me tell you a couple things that commitments do for you when you make a commitment. Your commitment will reveal your core values in your life. Think about that. What I'm committed to, what I believe in, is what I'm committed to. Listen to what Matthew 6, verses 31 to 33 uh, says. Don't worry about these things. This is Jesus talking. Don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with food and shelter and clothing. Jesus is not saying that you should never worry about wearing clothes. He's not saying you should never worry about eating a meal. He's not saying that you should never worry about any of those things. What he's saying is there has to be something of greater value in your life. There has to be something greater that you commit to. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And what he means by that is simply that that's all they think about. That's really all they have to think about. It's the, it's the now. It's the immediate. It's not eternity, but it's what can I do now? What happens to me now? What can I get now? Now, once again, Nothing wrong with planning, nothing wrong with having a job, nothing wrong with having a house or a car or retirement. God's not suggesting you should not plan. What he's saying is that there has to be something more. There has to be something more than just a job. There has to be something more than just a house. There has to be something more than just a bank account. There has to be something more in our lives if we're going to really be committed to God. He said, this dominates the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So in other words, I've got you covered. That's what God's saying. When you commit to me, I've got you covered. I've got your back. I'm taking care of you. And so what I want you to do, he says, is seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Isn't that good news? Our heavenly father loves us so much that when we seek him, uh, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, he said, uh, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? For they will be filled. God will satisfy you. Have you ever noticed that there are a lot of things in life that really don't bring satisfaction? Many of you know that I grew up in North Carolina and grew up working on a tobacco farm. Everybody in my family for generations had worked on tobacco farms. And um, so there were a lot of uh, tobacco users in my family, as you can imagine. Uh, a lot of people smoked. Um, a lot of people dipped and chewed. And uh, I took my first chew of tobacco when I was six years old. But they were all kind of egging me on. I spit about a gallon in like 32 seconds. It was, it was awful. And then I swallowed a little bit of it and I got sick. All right. So, uh, so I don't recommend doing that. 
but I grew up in tobacco country, and I remember uh, in North Carolina, they had these television advertisements that they would advertise cigarettes. Now, I don't think they allow them to do that anymore, but back then, they had uh, cigarette advertisements on television, and uh, I remember them advertising Winston cigarettes. It said, Winston cigarettes, they satisfy. That was their tagline, they satisfy. And even as a little boy, I wondered if they really satisfy, why do they come 20 to a pack, right? You know, because I'm not sure that they really did satisfy. But I do know this, there are many things in life that don't satisfy. There are many things in life that will let you down. There are many things in life that will not meet the standard of your satisfaction. But when you trust God and you commit to him, it will reveal in your life those things that truly do satisfy. And by the way, it's the only way to know what satisfies is following Jesus and making a commitment to him. So making a commitment will reveal your core values, what you truly believe in, uh, what you truly value. Uh, Another thing it will do is it will shape your life. You ever notice that the things we commit to shape the way that we live, shape the things that we do? There are many of you that um, you love to hunt, and that shapes uh, what you do with your spare time. That shapes how you spend your money. There are many of you that love to fish, and uh, I've, you know, hunting and fishing, I have no problem with that. I just think that there are cheaper hobbies than that. Uh, I'm not sure what they are. Most men have really expensive hobbies. Playing golf is pretty expensive. Hunting is pretty expensive. Got a lot of equipment you buy. And I I love fishermen because they've got to buy a $30,000 boat and a $50,000 truck to pull it. And they've got to have thousands and thousands of dollars uh, worth of equipment to go out and catch a fish that is worth about 12 cents. All right. So uh, a lot of guys will uh, spend money on something that they enjoy. But here's what I know. My commitments shape my life in the same way that Uh, what I commit as far as just simply a hobby will shape what I do with my spare time. My commitment to God will shape my life as well. Listen to what uh, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, above all else, guard your heart for it affects everything you do. We've got to guard our heart. We've got to guard our commitments. Another thing that commitment does is it will create your destiny. You see, it will begin to reveal your core values. It will begin to shape your life. And when you begin to do that, you know what happens? It points you toward a destination. It points you toward a destiny. Uh, Psalm 37, 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will act. Whenever I commit my way to the Lord, God begins to work on my behalf. God is looking for people to be committed. Here's the second thing. Commitment will cost you something. It's going to cost you something. Uh, The apostle Paul wrote there in in Romans 12, 1, that we're to give our bodies as a living sacrifice. God expects that I commit to him. He expects that I commit to his ways. He expects that I commit to his kingdom. And by doing that, I'm offering myself as a living sacrifice. I'm going to challenge you on this. Don't get so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. I know a lot of people, they try to separate their spiritual life and their daily life. I get my church in on Sunday, might read the Bible every once in a while, listen to a, 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 a nice Christian song occasionally, maybe watch a Christian program or something. And, uh, but then as far as that goes, it doesn't really affect anything else that I do because I check the box and I go on about my week, and uh, then next Sunday, I'll do my Jesus thing again, and I'll check that box, and I'll go on about my life. But that's not the way God wants us to live. He wants us to make a full commitment of our lives to him. Listen to what Luke 14, 26 says, and these are the words of Jesus. He said, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is setting a very high standard. He did not say you could not be a Christian. 
He did not say you could not go to heaven. He did not say you couldn't even be a follower of Christ. But he said you could not be a disciple. What is a disciple? It is a person that is committed. It is a person that is a student of, that is learning, that is following. And what Jesus wants for us is to be his disciples. But if you're going to be a disciple, it will cost you something. It's going to cost you some time. It's going to cost you some uh, valuable thinking time. It's going to cost you some money. It's going to cost you uh, in certain things that you give up that you don't do any longer. I mean, let's just be honest. If you're going to come to church, you got to give up sleeping in. You're going to come to church, you got to get out of bed. That's kind of the way it works, right? So any commitment will cost you something. And I, I want to just give you a couple thoughts here that will help you in learning how to stay committed. Listen to this. Commitment means to give God control of your thoughts. I give God the first thought of each day. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 5, 3. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. I don't know about you, but in reading the Bible, I do better if I read it in the morning because I get real busy and uh, by the time I get home and uh, get around, I get in bed and I forgot, right? So in the morning time, it's best for me. And so I have learned to give God the first thoughts of my day. And when I give God the first thoughts of my day, prayer, reading some scripture, it makes my day go better. But then it's going to cost me control of my time. I give God my thoughts, and I must give God my time. Uh, the first day of the week, you know, in the New Testament, the reason they started worshiping on Sunday was because that's the day that Jesus resurrected from the grave. Before that, they worshiped on Saturday. That was the Sabbath. And so I am to give God the first day of the week. By giving him that Sunday, I'm putting him first in my time. And then I'm to give God control of my possessions. I'm to give him uh, the first tenth of every paycheck. In other words, I'm to give him the full tithe. And when I give God the tithe, then God promises to bless me. Listen to Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. And the verse goes on and says, so shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses will burst out with new wine. In other words, God's going to bless you when you put him first in your finances. And then I need to give him control of my decisions. I give God the first consideration in every decision. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You know, the reason some people are so lost, so confused, so much without direction in life is because they don't do what Solomon wrote, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust in your own understanding. Don't trust in just yourself. You know, I give myself advice a lot of times. Sometimes it's not very good advice, you know? I mean, I, if I am going to get somewhere in life, I cannot just trust on the way I feel. I cannot just lean on my experience. I cannot just lean on what I know. Because you know what I learned a long time ago? Even though I used to think that I knew everything, uh, I don't know everything. In fact, there's so much I don't know. The, more, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know that much at all. I used to tell my kids when they were teenagers they needed to run for president while they still knew everything, right? Well, when you begin to understand that you don't know everything, you need to depend on the Lord. Here's the third thing I want you to see. Commitment is normal for Christians. It's a normal action. It is an expected thing. It's not out of the ordinary. It's not some kind of extraordinary, rare thing. But being committed as a Christian is a normal thing. Listen to, uh, once again, Proverbs, I'm sorry, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, when it said there that we were um, to make this reasonable commitment. The word spiritual worship there can be translated rational or reasonable service. You know what God's saying? It's reasonable to serve him. It's reasonable to commit. It's not anything extraordinary. It's not something that is so unusual that 
when someone does commit, we all gather around and watch and say, wow, what an unusual person. No, we are to be in our daily lives committing ourselves to God on a day-by-day basis, and I would say even on an hour-by-hour basis, and to understand that that kind of commitment is rational, it's reasonable, it's normal. Number four, commitment flows from a transformed mind. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You know how you get your mind transformed? Through the preaching and the teaching of the word of God, through the reading of God's word. Uh, Get you the Bible app, play it on the way to work every day. Uh, Get it where it will read it out loud to you. Uh, read the Bible, listen to sermons, listen to the Word of God being taught. You know what that's going to do? It's going to begin to transform your mind. And before you know it, you're going to have a different way of thinking. You see, you cannot change your behavior until your thinking has changed. A lot of people think that, well, man, you know, I'm going to go on this diet, and uh, boy, I'm going to lose some weight. And you start out gangbusters the first day, you eat a piece of lettuce, and a, and a stick of broccoli, and I would rather go hungry than eat broccoli. That's just my opinion, okay? Not, I get so hungry, I'll eat broccoli even, okay? But I'm going to be tempted to eat some grass before I eat broccoli, all right? So I'm not a big fan of broccoli. Maybe you are. The only way I really like broccoli, if it's covered in about 500 calories worth of cheese, and then I can eat it, right? So, uh, so but no, if I'm going to if I'm going to be committed to a diet, to a healthy diet, you know what i got to do? i got to change my thinking. And I can have all the willpower in the world, but until I change my mind and I understand that by not eating healthy, I'm damaging my body, I'm cutting my life short, until I'm convinced of that, then, you know, cheese fries, here I come. You know? Because the fact is, you and I must understand that we must change our thinking. And the only way to truly change your thinking for good and for God is through the word of God. He says, when you do that, you'll be able to discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I would challenge you as we come close to making our commitment for doing our part, that you would allow God to speak to you, to change your mind, And to reveal to you what his will is. Here's what I know. If every person will pray and ask God what it is that they are to do, then we'll be okay. Everything we set out to do, we're going to be able to do. We're going to be able to reach more people with the gospel. Here's what I know. Um, If we just depend on our reason, then we're not going to see God work in our life through faith. Kim and I have been praying about what we're committing and uh, we've been talking about it. And uh, it's a little scary, to be honest with you, uh, because we don't have that much money. We don't have that much money in the bank. We don't have uh, that much money uh, lying around. We don't have that much extra money. If we give what we believe that God's wanting us to give, it is going to be a stretch of our faith. And the same thing for you. If you'll pray and ask God to reveal to you, it might be a little scary. It might be a little bit of a stretch of your faith, but it will be a wonderful opportunity for God to work in your life and to transform the way that you think. Matthew 25, verse 23 says, the master will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to I'm trying to live my life to be able to hear one day when I stand before God, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. And I believe if we can hear that from him, that will be all that we need to hear, and that will be enough. And so today, I want to encourage you to make a commitment. If we're going to do our part, we've got to commit. If we're going to reach people with the good news of Jesus, we've got to commit. We've got to commit to serve. We've got to commit to be a part We've got to commit to fellowship. We've got to commit to service. We've got to commit to giving. We must commit in order for our lives to be used by God to the fullest capacity possible. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us today to commit to you. 
Lord, I don't know what it is that people here in the room and people watching online need to commit, but you do. And during this time, I pray that you'd help them to do that right now, to make that commitment of their lives to you. I wonder today, before I finish my prayer, if there would be anybody that would say, Pastor Richie, I need to commit my life to Christ. I need to receive Jesus as my Savior. Well, I would encourage you to pray something like this in your heart. Dear God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I believe his finished work is enough. I'm not depending on my goodness, but on yours. And so right now, I pray that you would save me. I pray that you'd give me the faith to trust you. And I'm asking you to save me right now. If you're online and you prayed that prayer, I would encourage you to click the button and let us know. If you're in the room and you prayed that prayer, take the next step card, put your name on it, check on there that you prayed to receive Christ today. I wonder if there's someone that would be in the room today that would say, Pastor, there's an area of my life I need to commit to God. There's maybe it's something that you're doing that you know you shouldn't do. Maybe it's an area of your life that you've been struggling with. But you'd say, Pastor, there is an area of my life or something in my life that I need to commit to God. And I want you to pray with me about it. Would you just raise your hand? Anybody like that in the room today? A lot of folks. A lot of folks. God bless you. Father, I pray that you'd help us to commit to you, whatever it is. Lord, for those that need to commit to a place of service, help them to commit. For those that need to commit to being a member of Avalon Church, help them to commit. For those that need to commit to doing our part, this campaign, I pray that you'd help them to commit. God, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.